Good morning and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. Uh, my name is Brent. On camera with me today is Andrew and in FC is Alex and Tara. Um, for those of you who might be new viewers, we are literally live. Um, what, so what I'm seeing, you seeing, by a few seconds. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, and it's going to be a great drive. It's been a fantastic start already. Um, as you can see, we've got a, a hyena. And we've got a male leopard up the tree with an impala kill. Uh, it's been a nice, easy start for us. Um, we haven't come very far from our camp. Um, if we have a look just over my shoulder through this fence, we'll see a light and a wall there. And that is final control. So that's where um, the office is. And we're literally 50 meters from it sitting with a male leopard um, and, a, and a hyena. Incredible patience that hyenas show at leopard kills. Just feeding off tiny scraps that drop uh, and hoping that possibly the leopard is going to make a mistake and drop a, a much bigger piece of meat. So you can see oh, there's still quite a bit of meat left on the impala. So I'm confident that the leopard's going to be here for a, a while. And this Unless he drops it, now he will then make off. Oh. Is he eating the eye at the moment? Evidently, there was an eye there. So just to remind everyone um, that we, we are interactive with the audience. You are able to send us questions about what we're seeing um, and about the African bush. Um, so you can send those questions to uh, via email, questions at wildearth.tv, or if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag Safari Live. So we're just going to go over what's been happening in the bush, sort of a, uh, sort of a news catch-up, um, to keep you guys all up to date with the bush news. Um, so. Yesterday, or probably last night, um, this leopard killed the, killed the impala um, and he stashed it up the tree to protect it from hyenas. And um, <laughs> for those of you watching yesterday morning, it was pouring with rain, uh, so we weren't actually able to go out. Uh, although Stefan and myself did manage to go out and go, go track a little bit, and we did find this guy. Um, but he wasn't eating, he was lying in a bush hiding from the wet. And as I'm sure everyone can see, it's very grey, cloudy skies this morning. Uh, sorry guys, I just got to take the other radio. I'm chatting to the other game drives. Go ahead. Affirm, hey, make your way. Um, best access is, um, there's that little link road that goes between Voyas and Yuri's house. Um, if you're coming from the dam, uh, you'll get my visual from that little road. So, AFM. So, just to let you know, there are obviously uh, some wonderful safari lodges that we operate on their, their areas. So, we operate on Juma Private Game Reserve, where we are at the moment, and Arethusa Private Game Reserve. So, there are other vehicles around, um, and what they do is they've got people on safari uh, and they drive around and we we um, all work together so obviously the more of us out there the more of us tracking for animals the more animals we find and we all try to help each other by um, communicating over the radio also so we're sitting with the leopard Sean's on his way from Arethusa and he'd like to join us wow he's really getting stuck in. He's, he's going to try to probably open the brain cavity at the moment. Um, the brains will have quite a lot of nutrients and, and high in minerals. Uh, and when leopards do make a kill, they will go for those um, sort of high 
high sort of, oh, what's the right word for this? Um, high nutrient areas. So generally the first thing they'll eat is sort of uh, liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, um, and then brains, eyes. But they will, as you can see, he's also fed off some of the meat. So we can hear the other safari vehicle approaching now. So I, I know a lot of you guys out there are big fans of IDing animals and specifically the leopards. Um, so I'm just going to say, who can tell me which leopard this is? You can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Morning, morning. How's everyone this morning? Not too bad, and I only had to travel two minutes, two minutes from home. So just carrying on in the recap um, from what's been happening in the bush, so the bush news. Um, the nice thing about the bush news is it's constantly updating. Um, Everything's constantly changing and different things are going to let us know what's happening out there. Um, so apart from this young male who's, who's been on this kill for, for quite a while, um, since, la not last night, the night before sometime, um, Andrew and myself actually went out uh, on, a, on a drive uh, a little bit later yesterday um, with a... With a a friend of mine and um, we actually found another young male leopard um, probably about two and a half kilometers from here I took a photo of him I'm not sure which one it which which male leopard it is and um, but I will definitely when I get download my card from my camera I'll have a look So also, what else is, uh, was happening is that while we were out last night, we heard two different sets of lions roaring. Um, they sounded like females to the south of us, and then um, male lions to the north. So a little bit later in the morning, we are definitely going to go check those areas to see if we can find any tracks and possibly find the lions. Done power funk radio. That is correct. It is the quarantine male, or as I know a lot of you guys like to call him, Q male. So power funk radio was the first one. Uh, to the rest of you, I'm sure there's a lot who got it right as well. Well done. So you can hear a squirrel, now our final control, who's woken up 
and he suddenly said, oh my goodness, what a terrible start to my morning, I can see a leopard. So you can hear an alarm calling in the background. So those are the type of things when we refer to the sort of bush news we're talking about. Um, different animals will let us know that other animals in the area. So a lot of different animals, um, like squirrels and Franklins, and the leopards will eat, but very, very seldom and generally when they're younger. As soon as they, they spot a predator, even a lion, um, they will alarm and they're basically telling the rest of the bush, they're going, leopard, leopard, watch out, leopard. That hind is just waiting, waiting for something to fall. And as the leopards get towards um, where they've eaten quite a bit of the carcass and uh, lots of pieces sort of just hanging on by sinews of skin, and they try and reposition it in the tree, uh, that's when sort of larger pieces fall. Uh, and that's what the hyenas are waiting for. And I mean, I've seen hyenas wait for three, four days under a leopard carcass, just for tidbits to fall. And we've got a young hyena. You can see there's very few scars on the face yet and, or on the body, and, and the ears haven't been bitten too badly by flies. Good morning, Georgianne from Illinois. Um, Georgianne, I thought Konyuma young male leopard, um, for those of you who don't know, is this uh, male leopard's litter mate, so they're about the same age. She thought uh, he, had sto uh, he had killed the impala and, um, and quarantine had stolen from him. And we went out yesterday morning, but just chatting to other guides. As far as I understand, only quarantine was seen by by the guides, he, it, he might have been misidentified ident, first off. Uh, it does happen, um, we all do it. Um, so I cannot be 100% sure what happened because we, we weren't here. No one was here when the, when the kill was made. It was it, it during the night. But, and to answer the second part of the question is, George Ann would like to know, if this isn't true, does this actually ever happen? It does very much so. I mean, these two, uh, the two young boys will definitely uh, steal uh, kills from their mother. Um, and depending on the dominance between them, they definitely would try steal kills from each other. Uh, and then the dominant male leopard in this area will steal kills from all of them. Why, why must you hunt when you can beat someone else and take his food? Good morning, Anne-Marie from New Jersey. Anne-Marie would like to know if there are wild dogs in the area. And um, if, if there are, would they wait under a tree like the hyena for scraps? 
I mean, the last I heard of wild dogs, they headed south um, from from this area uh, into the central Sabi Sand. So at the moment, uh, not that I'm aware of that there are any wild dogs around, but they do move vast distances and very quickly, so they could very easily turn up. But uh, the second, to answer the second part of your question, Henry, they wouldn't wait um, under the tree for scraps like a hyena. If they weren't able to steal it outright, if it was on the ground, um, they would probably come and sniff around a little bit and then and move on. So I was perched just that back leg on that very small branch just balancing there while he feeds. So guys, I'm going to put it out to you. Um, we know this leopard is going to be here for, for quite a while. Um, so what would you guys like to do? Would you like to head um, east and see if we can go find some lions or some lion tracks so we can start looking for lions uh, and then come back here later on in the drive or would you guys like to stay here for longer um, please let me know what you'd like to do you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live if you're on twitter Good morning, Jennifer from Toronto. Strangely enough, before we went live this morning, Andrew and I were actually chatting about that. I said it'd be very interesting if lions did arrive. Um, probably not a male lion, but a lioness would definitely be able to get up there, and it would make a very interesting sighting to see what would happen. The leopard would probably try to get to the, the highest, smallest branches uh, and, and would give up his kill if, if lions did arrive here. Yeah. Good morning, Leah from Arkansas. Uh, Leah would like to know, do lions and leopards ever fight? Um, they do, but not really in the terms that there's a fair fight there. If a lion gets hold of a leopard, it's pretty much um, tickets for the leopard, I'm afraid. So leopards will generally try to avoid that and try to run away from them or climb trees. Though leopards do, if they find lion cubs um, that have been hidden or left alone, they will kill the lion cubs uh, to remove competition in the area. Any news on Angala from your side? No more what? But vessels. This is Matimbers were calling last night, almost the whole night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could get them from the uh, the Okay, cool. I might I might see you tomorrow. So Guys, I was just having a quick uh, chat with Sean from Arethusa. He's letting me know on the lion movements on uh, on that side. Um, 
and there is some interesting stuff happening. I think the Talala breakaway pride has um, killed a, a giraffe. Unfortunately, that's outside of our traverse area. Um, and then also, one of the Styx young lionesses has, has given birth um, to the south of us. So that's very interesting news. So there are some new lion cubs in the area, but unfortunately also not in our, tra in our traverse area. So I think we're going to go look for those lions we heard calling last night. But for those of you who might have joined us a little bit late this morning, we've got the quarantine male um, eating an impala. And uh, we're probably about 60 meters from final control. So very interesting. And then we had a nice easy start to the morning, so two minutes, and we were here. There's still quite a lot of meat left on this impala. So he's probably going to be here for a while. And there's a single hyena playing the patience game, waiting for titbits to drop. There we go. As we say it, one drops. And it's a tiny little piece of bone, but every little bit counts. So guys, I'm waiting to hear from you whether you'd like to stay with this leopard longer or should we go look for some lions on our eastern boundary. Remember to send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or just use the hashtag safari live on twitter well there we go i've just said thanks very much guys um we're gonna we're gonna move on now uh, the general consensus is that we'll definitely come back and check on on the sighting a little bit later uh, being so nice and nice and close to camp it's it's a very nice one to, to put in the sort of, uh, what does my dad would say, put it in the bank. Mm -hmm. So you just make sure, we will, and we'll keep, keep you updated on the sighting as it progresses. I'm sure all of us will cycle through here so we can actually see sort of the whole disappearing of an impala. Well, yeah, let's go look for some lions. Cheers everyone, have a good morning. Thanks for letting me treat. Absolute pleasure. I can't thank you for anything yet. Give us talk. The art. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Cheers guys. So what a wonderful way to start the morning. Those regular birds, I've been telling you what a softy I am when it comes to the cold. It's quite chilly this morning, probably, I don't know, I guess about 15, 15, 16 degrees Celsius. And I've already whipped out my grandpa's old down jacket. And I'm nice and toasty. And uh, when we first went out this morning, when I thought we might be driving for a while, it was quite cold. I even had my mitts. But it's not too bad now. So our plan is that we we're going we're gonna to head south first, uh, head to our southern boundary, start looking for tracks. That's where I, I heard quite a lot of uh, lion audio last night, and then we also heard other lion audio to our east. So we're going to check both those boundaries, see if the animals have moved in from the neighboring properties.
Good morning, Roz from the US. Roz would like to know what was the follow-up on a possible river sighting we had the other day. Uh, it was of an Eurasian hoopoe. Uh, Roz, I've sent the pictures off to the sort of bird experts that are in charge of saying yay or nay to, to sightings. Um, and we're still waiting to hear back from them. But the bird was a possible Eurasian hoopoe. My radio has been down for about 15 been in the aspect. Very last station go again. The FM all I copy is applied. Uh, I didn't copy, I just heard a pride crossing east somewhere, I presume it's so another reason why I'm checking this road, as I remember, I was updating you about our bush news from last night. Um, this is where we saw another young male leopard, and I wasn't quite sure. Um, who it was, but we didn't spend that much time with him. He didn't behave uh, like a uh, Kunuma, but uh, he's got a very distinct behavior when you normally drive up for the first time. Uh, so definitely gonna have to go look at those photos and see if um, it was a different young male. Because I know Scott had uh, the Bahuti young male leopard, he moved through this area and that's very quite uncommon, he doesn't normally come into this area. Um, he is a little bit older if I remember correctly, can you guys verify that for me, if Bahuti is older than Quarantine and Kunuma? So with it still being overcast from all the rain yesterday, uh, the ground's still quite saturated, hasn't hasn't dried out. So there's definitely going to be some places we're going to have to drive quite carefully because uh, I don't feel like getting stuck and having to dig in, uh, dig in the mud this morning. I can always just let Andrew do it. Ah, moving. Well spotted, Andrew. Do you see those sort of dark patches on the tree there? Andrews has spotted some vivid monkeys waking up. Uh, let's go to the left ones. And you can see part of the morning ritual going on. Um, aloe grooming. So they, they're grooming each other, probably removing fleas, ticks. And with most social animals, this is a very important part um, of their life because it, it affirms the, the relationships within in the social group. Uh, and specifically with primates, as we are primates, we know, uh, sort of touching, hugging is all, all reassuring stuff. So you'll notice that with primates quite often um, that there's quite a lot of physical contact, especially when they wake up in the morning and when they're about to go to sleep at night. And that's just reaffirming the, the, the bonds within the group because 
you might have a squabble over a, a marula during the day and you really don't like that other monkey for a while. So this is sort of to make everything right um, and, and keep the, the, the bond in the social group strong, which will always make it a bit, uh, will make it better um, when they're all looking out for each other, spotting for predators together, rather than trying to be a lone monkey. Yeah, well, we'll leave them in to their morning, morning rituals. Another animal do quite a bit of that is um, baboons, also obviously a primate. But you do see it in, in, in some of the predators as well. Specifically when you shoot at, um, there's a lot of that sort of backing up of the, the, the social bonds. And, and it's very important in lion prides because when lions eat, it's each lion eat each other. They bite each other. Sorry guys, we just went uh, through a little dip there um, and the combinations of the, the weather and, uh, and that low-lying area that caused us to lose, uh, lose signal. So we apologize for that. It's one of my favorite little antelopes. Just on the edge of the drainage line there. I go back to the little female pushback. They're such a dainty antelope. They always definitely one of my favorite antelopes. It's very beautiful. And the way they move, they're so quiet. You see how they move very very carefully constantly listening so they quite often live uh, in an area where there's well they live on the edges of drainage lines and thickets so also the same type of areas that leopards like to hang out in so they, they've got to be quite careful I'm just going to see if we get one last look at her uh, I think she's disappeared um, so quite an interesting little story about pushback you guys are looking carefully you see there's like little white dots on her and it looks like she's been almost drawn on um, and then the Latin name it's a it's a trafalegate so it related to Kudu and Inyala it's the same family but the, so we won't worry too much about the first part of the Latin name which is trafalegus which basically just means spiral horned antelope um, but the second part is scriptus which means literally drawn on and interestingly enough, even the, the, the Zulu and Shanghai name for, um, uh, for a bush bug is Mbabala, and that literally means the one who's been written or drawn on. So quite a nice little thing. Very, very pretty antelope. Oh, we got some big elephant bull tracks in the road. Look like from quite early last night, um, and I did hear from Steph uh, two days ago. It was a big must bull around. Um, I can't smell must, so it means it must have passed quite a long time ago. And when the elephant bulls on must, they do travel quite large distances and they move, move chasing after the girls.
morning, Valerie. Welcome on Drive with us on this chilly morning. Uh, Valerie would like to know, do we get serval cats in South Africa? We do, Valerie. We actually do get them in the Sabi signs. Um, they are more difficult to see because they don't occur in that. Um, but I have seen them in the Sabi signs before. Um, and especially now as we head in towards the season, although it's all wet and whatnot from a very late rain, yes, we head towards the dry season we're gonna there's the, the possibility of seeing things like serval will increase because the grass will flatten down and um, trees are not so you'll build a bit of it. during the dry season you have do have a much better chance of seeing uh, those smaller more elusive cats Valerie, welcome on drive with us this morning. Sorry about that, I think we're just going through a little bit of a break up there. I think it's a lot to do with this low cloud cover we're experiencing this morning. Um, Valerie would like to know if we got serval cats in um, in the Sabi Sands uh, or in South Africa, and we do. Uh, and I was saying that they, they don't occur in that high densities, which makes them quite difficult to find. Also, one of the other things is that they're quite difficult to see. They like long grass. It's where they prefer to hunt. So during the winter months, as the bush gets drier and the grass flattens out, we've got a, a better chance of seeing them. Sorry, guys. Just to explain to you what, what's going on here. So this is where we saw that other male leopard last night. I'm just going to have a quick walk on the road around us and whatnot, have a look for any tracks, just so I can let the other game drive vehicles know uh, which direction in case they're heading in that area and they might be able to find them. Then we're going to continue on to our eastern boundary uh, and, and see if we can find some lion tracks. Like he's actually heading the same direction we are, um, so we will keep a lookout for him or tracks as we head uh, towards our southern boundary. of the young Madure Ingwe heading uh, south from the junction between dams and elephants call. I'll follow up while they are while I'm in the air. So 
it's very important that we communicate well with uh, all the game drive vehicles as it makes. Oh, I'm gonna run inside. They have disappeared. They're still there. Are they? No, they were, uh, they were too little darker. Uh, the game drive vehicles. Welcome back, guys. So we just tipped through a, a drainage line there, uh, and with the combination with the weather, it does sometimes cause for some signal difficulties. Uh, we apologise for that. Um, but as I was saying, the reason that I here we go, and he's back on the road here. Yeah. And we can show you the tracks there. There are the leopard tracks going down the road. There's the same tracks I found where I was walking around there earlier. I said he was heading in a southerly direction, same area as us. Um, and I called it in on the radio, even though we've had a fantastic leopard sighting. Um, with them lying in the tree, there's a strong possibility later in the day he's just going to be sleeping at the bottom of the tree, which is always wonderful to see leopard, but um, it might not be the best sighting for a photographer or something who's on safari. So we'll always call and let them say, oh, there's leopard tracks going this way, in case someone else would want to go look for them. And sometimes it might be us who wants to go look for a different leopard. So. It's very important that we communicate and have a good relationship with all the guides. Good morning, Dennis. Dennis says he assumes in the dry season there's less cover. Does this affect predator hunting techniques? Well, Dennis, one of the things the dry season does make it easier for the predators to catch animals um, because they are forced onto certain water points. Uh, so it, 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 in a lot of ways it is easier and quite a lot of the water will always be in the low-lying areas around the drainage lines where there are natural thickets of evergreens that are not going to disappear during the dry season. Good morning, Sinead. Welcome on drive. Uh, Sinead would like to know when was the last time we saw ground hornballs um, and how's the ground hornball research project going? Um, well, so I haven't seen them, but I actually heard them last night. Um, they were calling just after sunset. A wonderful, wonderful call. Sorry, Sinead, I'll be here in a second. I'm just checking the tracks here. Um, uh, as far as I know, the, the, there has been quite a bit of, uh, of good news with the ground hornbills, with a lot of old cattle areas turning into game farming. Uh, there, there has been a little bit of increase. 
but I don't know too much about it. Um, but I, I can have a have a have a look when I get back uh, and find out from a friend of mine who does some work for them uh, and see what she says. Ephraim, come in. Station with that Shamanyari coming. If so, what were whereabouts in Gary Buffalo? So, it doesn't look like that young male leopard has crossed the boundary, so he's probably sleeping up in the area around Twin Downs. But no one wants to uh, follow up on him just yet. And we're on the, we're on the line march today, or for now. I'm going to drive very slowly. Um, after the rain, it makes it uh, quite difficult to see tracks because it compacts the earth, so it's, it's harder to see the tracks, even of a big animal like a lion. So I'm going to go very slowly here and um, just check carefully. This is the general area where I thought I heard the lions roaring last night. So basically, if we, if we carry on with the news, I had the news last night, now I'm looking for the updated news on the road. Good morning, Ro May on Twitter. Welcome on Drive with us this morning. Ro would like to know, do female lions move away from the breast of the pride when they give birth? And if this is true, how long until they sort of bring the cubs back to the pride? That is, it is very true, uh, Ro May. Uh, lioness will move off generally to quite a secluded spot, a uh, drainage line, uh, a rocky outcrop, uh, for her first den with the cubs and the reason for this is that life in a lion pride can be quite uh, busy and aggressive especially around a kill as I said there's no sort of friends when they're eating only afterwards and before um, so they even the older cubs quite often get quite seriously hurt or sometimes even killed around the carcass while the, uh, the adults are feeding so while the lion cubs are still small and developing they do keep them away and it's, it, it depends on the lioness. I've seen them bring cubs in as, as soon as a month and also as late as, as two and a half, three months. But it's probably generally around two months or so that they will start introducing them, or two to three months they'll start introducing them to the, to the pride. Also, lions have a very, very short gestation, like a lot of the predators. It's just over three months, on a nine, uh, 100, 100 days or so like that. Um, and for this, is they have a very, very high mortality rate. So, the majority of the cubs will not make it to adulthood. Will not actually make it past the first six months of life. So, because of this very quickly so to, to replenish stock so to speak so 
example, if a lioness loses her, her cubs, she also immediately comes, within about 10 days, comes back into estrus and will start mating again. Um, so yeah, short, but a lot of your predators have short uh, gestation periods. Leopards as well. Oh, hello, right on tracks on this road. So we heard some calling to the south. Now we're going to check our eastern boundary. So there was some calling to the south, some calling to the east. I'm hoping that one, one of them will now check the southern section. Across there, so we're now going to check the boundary. Sorry guys, sorry about that. The weather is playing a bit of havoc with our signal this morning. Um, oh, there's a zebra and it looked like it's got an escape. Open dash on, it, on its body. A zebra, I'm um, seeing the bush here. Uh, it keeps moving. It's got a big open wound that is more than likely caused by a lion. So we'll try a few of it. There we go. I don't know if you can see there, Andrew. Just tell me forward or back. I'm trying to get it. It keeps moving. It keeps moving. <laughs> okay, wait. We'll follow the zebras. Are we going to get a shot? Yeah. yeah. She goes onto the road. Oh, and a giraffe as well. Yeah, we're going to wait. So it's the that you can see on shot now on her left hand side go, keep turning keep turning there we go I'm almost a hundred percent sure now that this zebra has escaped from a pride of lions That is quite a deep gash and it looks very fresh um, within the last day or two. Just muscle, so there isn't that much damage, hasn't nicked tendons or... <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see what the lion looks like, if that's what the zebra looks like. Yeah, it would be quite, a, quite interesting. Um, with the, we'll be able to see if the zebra does survive and it heals, the stripes won't add up anymore. They'll be off, off. They won't, they won't be perfectly sort of symmetric anymore. And you can often see that on, on zebras that have survived attacks by lions, that now, now the sort of the, the stripes are slightly out of sync. looking at us at the moment. Sorry guys, Doing that clicking. It's just me taking a photo. I wanted to get a photo of the 
That wound on the zebra. Gonna move a little bit so we can have a look at everything. And zebra here. Only one drop. There could be some others around. So zebras despite what a lot of people think, are actually quite good at defending themselves against lions, although they do get eaten like everything. Um, but they do break lions' jaws from time to time, defending. So what probably happened is the lion left of that zebra, and the zebra would have kicked out with its back legs, and and, and, and really hard, and they, and they can do some serious damage, even to a, a, as large as lion. Copy. So we're saying about that that zebra uh, is that actually can be quite quite good with what I think's happened with this particular zebra we're seeing here is that uh, there's probably a lioness or a lion on top, on top and it's given a really good kick both legs it sort of buck back out kick and that has dislodged the lion um, from it and has managed to escape I mean there have been records of breaking lions jaws um, in defense um, so unlike what most people would think, zebras can be very aggressive animals, and amongst themselves they are, they are extremely aggressive, specifically the stallions, and they fight for, for harems, is what, which is sort of the, the term used for a zebra. You have a stallion who keeps a, a harem of females, and, and the competition for those females can be very, very aggressive and very bloody. They bite and kick each other. Let's try to go forward so we can have another look. Wound. Ah, oh, there's a quarry in the way. And something gave the giraffe a fright. The giraffe was off to our left, it took off, and then sent the zebras off as well. You could find just the general nervousness, uh, nervousness of the animals in this area at the moment. There have been lions in the area quite recently, um, which is judging from the, the sky down the side of the, just their general demeanor. Rindu, they have had a, probably had quite a, a stressful evening, so I'm not gonna push them too much. Um, just leave them be for now. We're gonna continue to see if we can find some lion tracks. But that's very interesting to see that. And if the zebra does survive, I always like seeing the zebras that survive um, <laughs> where their stripes don't line up anymore.
Good morning, Billy Joe from Florida. Billy Joe would like to know whether ox peckers will help. Um, actually, the complete opposite. Quite often, ox peckers are, are very bad for um, for wounds like that in animals because they'll keep it constantly. They'll eat the flesh from from it. So what I'm doing is tracking where the zebra have come from. <laughs> Maybe we'll find lions where the zebras came from. Welcome back here, man. Um, as you can see, this dark, low-lying cloud is, is, is playing a bit of havoc with our, our signal this morning. But we are back. Um, Billy Joe, to go back to your question, uh, Billy Joe was saying that would the ox peckers help uh, the, the wound on that zebra hill? Uh, and I was just saying, no, Billy Joe, it's quite the opposite, actually. Um, the ox peckers were there. Uh, actually aggravate the wound um, by pecking at it and keeping it open for longer uh, than it would normally be. So what I've been doing now is I've been following where the zebra have come from to see if there are any lion tracks where they've come from. Not something we do every day but nice change. Backtracking a zebra. Don't think I've done that before. Good morning, Bob, from Chicago. Uh, Bob would like to know, would the zebra with the wound now be prone to infection? Most definitely, Bob. Uh, definitely a greater chance of uh, infection. But it is unbelievable how resilient animals can be and how their bodies can uh, recover from, I mean, that looked like a huge open gash. Uh, and I still think, just judging by the way it, it, the zebra Sorry, Bob, one second. There's tracks of zebra running in all directions around here. Yeah? Now we need to look a bit more closely for lion tracks. But sorry, Bob, back to your question. Um, that's definitely more, more prone to, to infection now. But the other thing is that those animals, animals can be so resilient. Um, and the, the big thing there, I think, that it's just a flesh wound, it's just in the muscle. It, it, the zebra didn't look like it was limping, so it hasn't nicked any tendons or ligaments or, so arteries. Um, so I think there's probably a good chance that that zebra would probably survive that wound, but it might get an infection and, it might, and then it might not. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if we, if we manage to see that zebra again. The problem with following up on that type of stuff is that the, the ze animals like zebra and wildebeest do move quite big distances. Um, so 
we may or may not see see her again. So there's a lot of tracks of zebra running in both directions. So we're just going to go very slowly now and hopefully we find some line tracks. Good morning, Percy. Um, Percy would like to know how fresh that wound on the zebra was. Um, we said a little bit earlier, I think it, it is quite fresh. It's within the last uh, sort of day or two at the most. from coming. Ephraim, Ephraim, do you copy? Judy from California. Um, Judy would like to do giraffe travel in groups uh, and if so what is the collective noun for giraffe? Um, they do sometimes travel in groups Judy. They are, uh, in this area they seem to be a little bit more solitary but you do find groups of giraffe um, and the, the original so most animals we just call it a herd of giraffe or whatnot. But if we, if we want to have some fun, Judy, you've given me a great idea. We're going to play a little game after. I'll, I'll give you guys the first one. But we're going to play the collective noun game. So there's a lot of strange collective nouns from sort of a Victorian English with African animals. Um, so a collective noun for a giraffe can be one of two. It's either a journey of giraffe or a tower of giraffe. But now, for you guys, I'm gonna go through a couple of animals and see if you guys can get the original collective nouns. And we'll start with a nice easy one. I'd like to know the original collective noun for a group of rhinos. Uh, send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. A little termite mound spotted a couple of my favorite little creatures. I should probably just go a bit closer. They definitely, after a cold morning like this, they're only waking up now. Mongies. They'll be coming out of their nocturnal hideout now as it gets a bit warmer.
it's always good to just sit quietly in the bush for a while as well and listen to see if we hear any alarm calls. Oh, pops head down. Done, Jennifer. That is correct. The old English collective noun for rhino is a crash. A crash of rhino. And since we have three now, little dwarf in front of us, I think I'm going to ask you for the old collective for mongoose. For mongooses. Mongoose? Mongoose? Mongooses? But, uh, what is the original collective noun for mongoose? Please send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So guys, for those of you not sure what that fast clicking was there, it's just two sweets of a shot up on. So they'll be quite cautious, as you can see at the moment when they're waking up. Uh, this particular sort of overnight stop for them isn't isn't quite an open area, so they will very cautiously come out of the the burrows, and they will be watching very carefully, specifically for birds of prey. They they can be quite vulnerable as they come out of the burrows first thing in the morning. Shanae, I can hear ground hornbills calling at the moment. They are quite far in the distance to the east of us, but I can hear them. Do 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 Actually, think might have their call. Trent, uh, Trent from Fiji says it's a band of mongoose. It's not, but uh, I think you might have got confused with the banded mongoose. So where that came from? The original collective noun for um, mongoose was not a band. I'll give you guys a little bit more time. Well done, Angie from Ohio. The original collective noun for mongoose is a business. A business of mongoose. See how they're coming a little bit further out, a little bit further out. Oh, and well, also, well done to Doris in Kentucky who also got business. Let's see if I have that um, ground hornbill call. I can just hear it, but I think it's a bit far in the distance for you guys to hear it.
So there you are. I'm just going to put it next to the mic. So that's what I'm hearing, but way in the distance. It's the ground hornbill core. And Diane in Michigan would like to know would the termites mounds have to be unoccupied by the termites for other creatures to use them? Um, it depends on the creatures, but a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of the time, yes, they'll, they'll be dormant um, before most of the other creatures start using them. Isn't that sweet? Look, there's a, a young one off to the right there. He's using that little. V there to, to rest his neck in. Um, but certain animals will use a, a termite mound while it's active, especially because the, the termites, all the heat coming from the, the termite mound, that uh, I know snakes might, snakes will use it when, when it is active. Um, probably one of the more interesting little creatures that has a very um, close relationship with with termites, oh, I don't have a picture of them here, unfortunately, but they're called, it's called an African thief ant. Um, and it basically looks like, a, or the, 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 the queen and, and the drone, which are um, the, the adults that move through to, to start new colonies, um, look like driver ants, um, and they, but except they're black, it's called an African thief ant. Um, if you guys want to have a look at what it looks like, um, just maybe just Google that for yourselves and you can have a look what the African thief ant looks like. So the way it gets its name, so the, the, the sort of alpha pair, the, the queen and the drone, are massive uh, in terms of the rest of the, the ants. The other ants are almost so small that you cannot see them. You have to really, really look. They're so tiny you cannot see them with the naked eye. And what it, what they do during the rainy season is a, a new pair will fly off and they'll land on the edge of an active termite mound and they will burrow into the side of the termite mound and uh, they will then uh, not only mate and lay eggs and set up a little colony, but when they leave their natal, natal colony, they leave with thousands of these tiny, minute, almost invisible worker ants on their bodies. So they, they sort of take their workforce with them when they move on. And these workers are so small that when they go into the termite mound, um, where the termites' larvae and eggs are, they're so small the termites don't notice them, and they collect the termites' eggs and carry them away to be eaten. And they're so tiny that the termites don't notice. Uh, I think that's one of the more interesting ones that really likes an active termite mound. And they live, so a very parasitic relationship, and they live in the, in the termite mound or just on, on the edge in a separate chamber. But the, and the, the, the workers are so small the termites don't even notice them stealing their eggs. I think we'll leave the little mongies to continue on and we're going to continue on see if what else we can find there he is. it's actually one of our zoomies welcome on drive One of our zoomies, welcome on drive with us this morning. Our mongoose, very organized like meerkats, do they have a similar social structure with an alpha pair doing all the breeding? 
Well, your social mongoose is yes, and well, a meerkat is actually a type of mongoose, so they are, they are quite closely related. But your social mongoose is yes, they do. I have an alpha pair that will do the majority of the beating. No luck with the lion tracks yet, but don't worry, I haven't given up. It's like they were teasing me last night, calling just south of us and just east of us, and I was like, ah, they sound like they're close, they're gonna come, and so far nothing. Naughty lions. Apparently there's a, some people asking that uh, somewhere someone's found that rhinos historically used to be called a stubbornness. I've personally never heard that. I only know about a crash. Um, the, the one, one of the old, uh, the, one of the really old English uh, sort of collective nouns for a buffalo, which sort of falls along those lines, was an indomitability of buffalo which is, I think, quite a good one. You sit there looking at that buffalo bull is looking down his nose at you. Um, but an indomitability of buffalo, I've never heard of a stubbornness of rhino. But now, we can definitely continue playing the collective now and game. Hmm, ah, since we saw them this morning, what is the collective noun for a group of zebra? Please send your answers to questions at Wild Earth TV uh, or just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. For those of you who are new and might be joining late for the drive, just to remind you, we are live on Safari in the Savi Sand South of South Africa, specifically um, between Juma Private Game Reserve and Arethusa Private Game Reserve. Um, so, whatever I'm seeing right in front of me, by a few seconds, you are seeing from wherever you might be in the world. And as you can see by my big fluffy jackets, the cold weather is upon us. Um, it's probably around 15 degrees Celsius at the moment, uh, overcast, low bank of cloud. I'm very happy that there's no wind because that would just make it much colder. Uh, and those of you who've been watching for a while have heard me saying through the summer how much that um, I think a lot of the other people think in camp think I'm a bit useless, but um, I've become already whipped out my grandfather's old down jacket uh, to keep warm. So it gets quite cold, we're not right into the coldest time of the year yet. When that happens you'll see me, I, you won't even, you'll just see my eyes. I'll be buried in scarves, beanies, gloves, uh, but it gets, it can get down to about zero or below zero very rarely. As we do get frost, but maybe once every couple of years. So it's a, it's a rare occurrence to get frost in this part of the world. But it does drop to around between 5, 3 and 5 degrees. When you're in an open vehicle like this, it feels much colder. But uh, it's probably on average between 5 and 10 uh, on the really cold mornings below 5.
degrees Celsius, that is. If it was Fahrenheit, that'd be a popsicle. Well done, Michelle in Massachusetts. That is correct. It is a dazzle of zebra. It's quite a nice one, a dazzle of zebra. You can sort of see the stripes sort of shimmering through the light in the late afternoon. Good morning, Jeffrey from Texas. Jeffrey would like to know what is the collective noun for wildebeest. Um, so, the really, really old collective noun, the sort of Victorian English collective, uh, applicable in the Sabi Sands as sort of in East Africa, specifically my of wildebeest. Sorry about that, Jeffrey. We just had a little signal glitch. Uh, Jeffrey, just to recap, was asking uh, what is the collective noun for wildebeest, and I was saying, well, the original colo uh, colonial collective noun for, for wildebeest isn't really applicable to, to the area we are in at the moment, but more applicable to sort of Tanzania and Kenya, between the Serengeti and Masai Mara, where you have that mi large migration, um, and. It was an implausibility of wildebeest. And that can obviously, that makes quite a lot of sense when you arrive there and there's 1.3 million wildebeest in front of you. So an implausibility of wildebeest. Good morning, Dennis. Uh, Dennis would like to know, do we get African grey parrots in this area? Uh, and what other type of parrots might we find in this area? Um, what I'm going to do, Dennis, is I'm, I'm going to get your question in about two to three minutes. I just want to make my way down towards uh, Buffalzok Dam, and there we can switch off, and there might be some animals behind us, and I'll get out my books out of the my trunk next to me and I will show you which parrot species etc occur here and answer the question about the African greys. Buffalo's a dam. 
And that's water. A pig. Back behind the small um, round leaf teak. Got him? Guys. Murphy's door. The water dogs always seem to wait just till we get them nearly in focus and then they run off into the thickets. So just a quick one for you, how can I tell the difference between male and female warthog? So let me know whether this is a male or a female, how can we tell the difference between them? Uh, and send your answers to question, via email to questions at wildearth.tv um, or tag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. notice I turn off the, the car and I've got a downhill and I just freewheel down the hill. The reason I do this is because I'm removing the engine noise which gives me a chance to listen uh, for different noises in the bush that might may alert me to the presence of another, another animal. But listening to the news so to speak. Mission from Dallas. Uh, Mission would like to know, do we get oryx in the area? Uh, unfortunately not. They are Kalahari sand species. Uh, well, the, the oryx we get here, which is also known as a hemspok, um, they occur, probably the closest naturally occurring oryx is about 150 kilometers to our north and slightly west. Is it? But with the heron on its head. Well done, Gilly, in Milwaukee. That is correct. Uh, m male warthogs have four warts on the side of their faces, and females have two. And then we've got a, a grey heron who's using a hippo as a fishing stand. So let's get... Oh, it looks like the heron saw a fish there, that quick head movement.
That's a clever tack uh, being used by that heron uh, to fish um, because a lot of fish species will actually feed off hippo dung so they do tend to hang around the edge of the hippo so it's a good spot to fish from if the hippo doesn't get it doesn't mind I'm just going to move forward a little bit so I can see up these little sort of drainage lines that flow into the dam in case there's something in them Nope, doesn't look like anything else around apart from the hippo and the heron. Also, if you look at it from a heron's point of view, it's a very safe place to fish from. Although, and it gets annoyed with you. So back to those parrots. So, those African grey parrots occur in this occur in this area. Sorry, the question from Marcia was um, which uh, parrots occur here? African grey parrots occur here. And as we have a look at the African grey parrot sitting there. And if we zoom in on the African grey parrot's distribution range, let me just find a little stick here. Over here. Can you guys see or not really? Oh, okay. Um, my tip, this is, uh, we are there. And the red represents where the African grey parrots are red. Unfortunately, uh, they do not. They are jungle, they are jungle or rainforest species. Um, I've been very fortunate enough to see uh, flocks of a thousand plus of them when I was working in the Central African rainforest, um, moving between the, the raffia palms and, and oil nut palms that they were feeding off. And But Andrew just spotted there that he's chasing with the camera is a pied kingfisher. There's another one. There's two of them there. So back to the parrots. Now we'll cover the parrots that do occur in this area. So number three the grey-headed parrots. Um, we don't see them that often, they're, they're slightly more, more rare. Um, and we generally might find them uh, in, they prefer sort of broadleaf woodland, uh, which is sort of um, a sort of grey-headed parrot. And we are there. And I have seen them close to here before, but not too many. And then the most common parrot, and the one we do see here very often, is number five brown-headed parrot. You can see it's got a, a distribution along the east coast of Africa from South Africa all the way into Somalia. Isn't that a wonderful sound? Mm. Oh, oh. So, everyone out there, i got a, a question for you. Can a hippo swim? 
can a hippo swim? Send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're on Twitter. Pam in Sussex is asking whether we have spotted eagle owls in this area. Uh, we do. Uh, they are probably our most common of the larger owl species. We also get veros or giant eagle owls here, um, white-faced owl, owlets, uh, scops owl, pearl spotted bard. Am I forgetting? Am I forgetting any? Don't think so. Good morning, Simon. Uh, Simon would like to know, have, have we seen that crocodile again here at Buffalo Zook Dam? Um, uh, we haven't, not for a while. But that's not not to say it isn't here. There are very stealthy animals, uh, but we just haven't spotted it. Good morning. Sorry, there we go. Jerry? Jerry would like to know, uh, do hippos mind the cold water in winter? Well, Jerry, I, I don't know. I'd have to ask the hippo. Um, I'm, I don't think so. It doesn't seem to, to bother them that much, though, when they, they do go into in and out of the water during the winter months. But just looking at that in a... Hearing that hippo just now reminds me of a quite a funny story that I I learnt and heard um, from a umbugush, which is a river san or a river bushman from Botswana when I was younger. And he said, "You never know where the hippos are the best jokers in the bush or the worst jokers in the bush because." They all go in the water together, and they tell each other the joke. And when they come up, they they, they come up laughing. <laughs> but you never know whether they're like actually laughing at the joke, or they're laughing at how embarrassingly bad the joke was, or even the third option. You know, no, they're laughing at the fact that you're just the one who doesn't know the joke. Well done, Lisa Osborne, for answering the question that I asked just now. Do hippos swim? They don't. Um, they run along the bottom of the water. I mean, they can't run on the bottom of the water. They run on the bottom of, uh, of the body of water. On, so they run along the uh, on the bottom, and uh, they can hold their breath for about five and a half minutes. Um, so that gives them a chance to get to a shallow area where they can um, breathe again. Guys, there might be a little bit of single breakup. I'm going down into a steep drainage line quickly, but I'll be out of it in very shortly.
Good morning, Jody from New Mexico. Jody would like to know, can baby hippos swim or what do they do? Look, Jody, they will actually do the same as the adults, but when the adults are, are resting in water that's a little bit too deep, they will actually sort of hitch a lift or ride on the back of their mother and lie on the top of a mother's back as well. Last question, go again. Hi, Finn, I'm copying you 5-5. Five five. I confirm the one at Yuri's Kaya. Copy, thanks. Yeah, I would like to slowly make my way. I'm still quite far, but I am making my way in that general direction. Guys, that's uh, we've tried to find those lions. Uh, they were calling to the east and to the south of us. I've checked our southern boundary and I've checked our eastern boundary. So they were obviously teasing me, saying, you can't find me, nah, 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 nah. So we've checked there and they haven't crossed into, into Juma. So um, they're probably still sitting on those properties uh, to the south and to the east of us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slowly start meandering um, back towards our sort of Vuyatilla Dam area, uh, see what we can find. Um, I'm trying to guess, we saw the, the tracks of that elephant bull headed in this area, and if he's in must, he could be following a herd, so I'm just trying to see if there's any tracks of elephants now. Um, and then, a little bit later, we're going to head back towards where we started with the quarantine male leopard, um, who was on, who had caught in it, or we're not sure whether he caught or he stole, an impala uh, and see what's happening in that area where we started this morning so guys uh, unfortunately to get there I have to go along uh, this road uh, and there is going to be a bit of signal breakup for this first few minutes on this track so I apologize in advance and I will try and move through it as fast as possible
sorry guys, I think I've cut through the worst of the, the bad signal there. Just towards the end there, we did spot some, I spotted some tracks on the road and I just went back to see what they were. And it was a hyena track. There's a brown hooded kingfisher. Oh. Brown hooded kingfisher. Oh, off you That's one of our insectivorous kingfishers we get here. Whoa. Oh, isn't that lucky? That's what I said, turning off the vehicle uh, and moving slow uh, and freewheeling and stopping for birds and stuff. You hear stuff. I just heard a very upset elephant. I thought it sounded like it was reprimanding another elephant in the in the head. So we're gonna go see if we can find that now. Um, we got a question in from Elizabeth in Milwaukee, and she wants to know whether hippos, uh, when a hippo spreads the dung with by flicking his tail, is that a sign of aggression? Uh, it's it's just it, it. I suppose it could be considered. It is a, a sign of territory. Um, they do that to mark the territory to spread more of their scent. Uh, but interestingly enough, ter hippos are only territorial in the water. They're not territorial when they're out of the water. Even though a lot of their fights will be out of the water, it's over the water, not the land surrounding. So we heard that elephant sort of scream that somewhere around here. to keep you updated on the news out here. I mean, there's a bit more of a, it's quite a cold wind that started. I actually think it's probably dropped a degree or two and it's a bit even colder than when we started off this morning. Definitely colder. Yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> colder than we started off this morning. Maybe I might have put my mitts on. and listen again for a second. What we're trying to listen for is breaking branches, um, maybe another one of those very loud screams, or that very low uh, rumble that elephants give. That I don't hear anything close here. I'm going to move a little bit further along. It might have been a little bit further than I originally thought. looking for, for elephants there, Andrew. Mm -hmm. seen elephants in a while. That is true. There we go. It's a little bit further than I thought, but there's the herd. So it might be moving towards us. I'm just going to move forward a bit. I'm just going to try to find the, the best spot for us to view them from. Trying to match 
sure there's not a few more up ahead on the road before we go crashing into the bush. It doesn't look like it. Good morning, Cyprian, who's seven years old and from Seattle. Um, Cyprian would like to know how do I protect myself if I'm on foot tracking and walking in the bush? Um, do, I tra do I carry tranquilizers um, with me? And Cyprian, the way I protect myself um, is through knowledge and experience. So I've been very lucky. I've been in the bush for a very long time. And um, I've spent a lot of time with the animals. So the way I protect myself is to read what the animal's going to do and try and make sure I don't put myself in a dangerous position. And like people, um, animals have a way of talking to you. So they do tell you things, but they can't speak like we can, so they, they tell us with their body language. So an elephant, like that elephant did there, she raised her ears as we came in. She's just letting us know she's big, she's strong, and we mustn't push her um, because otherwise she can hurt us. But you see, we stop as soon as she does that, and now she's relaxed again, and she's just carrying on feeding. So there's things like that. So we, we, you learn how to, to, to read the news of the bush. And and in that you need how to read the different animals' behaviour. I hope that helps. Nice to have a a young viewer. Sounds like there's some more elephants uh, to the east of there. We can see three where we are now. Oh, thanks also to Sid in Chicago who had the same question as Cyprian. So we can see three elephants here, but I can hear quite a few more. Let's go. Stand correct, I think that's actually a young boy. And that behavior fits perfectly with um, a young male. He's just a teen, he's probably about, no, about maybe not quite a teenager yet, but um, little boys tend to make, like to make a lot of noise and shake their heads a lot at the vehicles. Um, and the most important thing is if, if we zoom out, Andrew, and we look behind him, so even though he trumpeted and made a lot of noise, there's a large female at the back, and she's the one who, make, who sort of would be calling the shots for this little, little group. So the fact that she didn't react comp at all to him trumpeting and making a noise uh, it means that we're completely safe. We're not actually doing anything. It's just a young elephant boy being a bit boisterous.
No, I'm sorry I called you a girl. Is that why you were trumpeting at me? I was using his phone. Okay. If we go white, just look down at his feet for a second. You can see how he's using his foot and his trunk together to dig something out. I can't see exactly what it is. I'm not sure if he's off the grass or something else. Stations at uh, Schlumberndorf uh, Central Road, uh, probably about 200 meters to the, or 300 meters to the junk, uh, to the, sorry, west of the junction with Drakensberger. And yeah, that crashing in the, uh, in the back there. There's definitely a few more elephants in the three we can see. We can hear them off to the north and to the east of us. Young Combretums by the looks of things, that last thing he had. Let's just try and move so we can get a slightly better view. Watch the thorns there on the left, Andrew. He's having quite a lot of fun there. I can't see exactly what he's. He looks like he's playing more than eating as we're driving up. Nice cool weather for the elephants. That means they're able to be active for longer in the day. I like little boy. Don't get naughty. Your mom will give you a give you a hiding. Make too much noise. Cause too much trouble. Good morning, Marianne from Boston. Uh, Marianne would like me to talk about some of the aspects of elephants in relation to human beings. 
Um, so their lifespan is very similar to a human being. Uh, it can be up to about 60, 65 years old. Um, when it comes to the human aspects, I don't believe the elephants have any human aspects. Um, I know there's a lot of people who will disagree and differ with my beliefs. Um, I think what Marianne was referring to is about how they react to the death of a, of a member of the herd by picking up bones and stuff like that. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with elephants in a lot of different countries um, and they pick up all bones, whether it's a hippo bone or a kudu bone or a lion bone or an elephant bone. Uh, they do tend to spend a bit of time around the carcass of a young um, calf when it dies, but then so do leopard and lion do that when their cubs die. I think it's more, with that side of stuff, it's more of an instinct, a mothering, mothering instinct that overrides um, in that situation. But when it comes to mourning the death of another elephant by touching the bones, um, in my experience and what I've seen over South Africa, Tanzania, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Gabon, Kenya, Uganda, um, is I personally think they are just more curious about the bones, uh, and it could be the bones of anything. I don't think they actually go through a mourning process at all and um, mourn over the loss of, of a herd member. Um, or it, because a lot of times that, that those bones are probably not from a herd member, they could be from another elephant. And a lot of the bones they pick up are very old, so it's very unlikely, in, in my opinion. Going to help the elephant in any way. That's a very, very good point there, Andrew has there. Um, Andrew says, in, in, in living out in the wild, how, and how is mourning uh, going to help the elephant in any way? Um, what we perceive as mourning, with uh, sometimes you see with leopard and lion when they lose cubs, um, it can help actually um, jumpstart their. Um, their uh, extra cycle again so they can start mating again. So we're going to leave the little one. I've been hearing another elephant off to the left here that's been breaking a lot of branches. Let's go have a look. And another little boy. This one's just a bit older. Um, Probably in his maybe late teens, early twenties. Morning, Tina from Houston. Tina was saying she thinks she noticed a, a growth or a bump on the young uh, elephant's head. I, I personally just didn't see it. I think you might be referring it uh, to the skull shape. I didn't see a growth or a bump. Did you, Andrew? Not no. I could notice that. So maybe just uh, the, the shape of the skull sometimes looks like it has a, a growth or a bump. And they do have completely massive skulls. So this, this particular elephant is, is eating grass at the moment um, and you can see how green the grass, some of this green grass has become just after that rain yesterday. Good morning, Elizabeth from Milwaukee. Um, Elizabeth would like to know about the pre-orbital gland, which is a gland that's just behind an elephant's eyes. Um, and she'd like to know whether it's only when they're in must. Uh, no, it is also it secretes when they're under stress, pressure, so it's sort of droughts. Um, 
and maybe if there's been hunting pressure from humans and stuff like that, it, it's a stress gland. They will, will secrete out of there. Um, sometimes during dry season, they can secrete quite heavily out of there. But with elephant bulls, generally most of the time they they, they only do secrete out of that when they are in must. But not all elephant bulls, just some. But it's definitely far more common to see um, female elephants secreting from their preorbital glands, um, and that could be for various different reasons. Um, quite often, when they're trying to push young males like this guy out of the herd uh, at about this age, he keeps following and chasing and making noise, which he's going to do to us right now. See, he's at that sort of teenage age where he's trying to show off and be a big deal, and that's when the the big cows will push elephant bulls of this age out. Um, so that can be quite a stressful time for them as well, so they also might secrete from their preorbitals during that. So you can see the, where we were earlier with the, the younger male and the females. And that is probably about 50 or 60 meters between this elephant and the others. And females will try to keep him in that distance. And that screaming that we heard that probably led us to finding these elephants was probably one of the females chasing this young male out. Yeah, it looks like. No, he's still feeding off grass. Ah, well done, Teresa on Twitter. That is completely correct. Um, the old co uh, collective noun for elephants was definitely a parade. A parade of elephants. And it always just reminds me of um, uh, you read uh, Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book and the way the elephants are described in that sort of a very much a, a parade and then also in that original Disney movie sort of the military parade of elephants and yeah great go away birds calling so elephants Quite interestingly, um, during the, the wet season, uh, on average about 80% of their diet will be grass and only 20% will be made up of trees and bushes. But now that completely changes during the, the dry season where it's the exact opposite. About 80% is made up from uh, trees and bushes and browsing and um, only 20% made up from grass and grazing. He's busy eating a baby knobthorn at the moment. Now, there are incredibly sharp little hook thorns on that knobthorn, so that's how we must realize how strong and thick an elephant's skin is. Good morning, Virginia. Virginia would like to know whether there's a difference in the mature, uh, maturing rates of male and female elephants. Um, not really. So they both reach sexual maturity at around the same age. The big difference is that because of competition, um, a male elephant will reach, will reach sexual maturity in his, his teens, of probably 14, 15, around there but will probably only get a chance to mate when he's uh, closer to 30 years old. Um, and that's the competition from the bigger elephants will not let the younger elephants mate. So where there's the, the, the females will, will reach sexual maturity at about the same time, but obviously they don't have to compete. Um, so the, they, they start breeding at a, at a younger age. What's your spotted? 
great go away first, but I don't think I can get it. No, they're quite far away. I can actually hear that the rest, the rest of the herd has moved further away. Oh. So, Sinead again. Um, Sinead would like to know a little bit more about the way an elephant's skull is made up, um, the honeycomb effect that it has to make it lighter, so the elephant doesn't have to carry around this very, very, I mean, not that an elephant cow isn't heavy, but it isn't as heavy as it could possibly be. Um, just give me a second, Janae. I think I have a good picture of it somewhere here. Yeah? Oh, sorry, Sinead, I don't actually have um, that picture in the book. I thought it was in this book, but it's not. Um, but then we... So, yes, they, they have a very uh, large honeycomb effect in their, in their, in their skull. And uh, what that does, it does make that very large head much lighter. Uh, and being a big animal, and it has to carry around a lot of weight, um, it... it it is a it is an evolutionary adaption to, to try and make sure that they they are able to carry the weight and you'll notice particularly as elephants get older and start losing condition how low their head starts to sit and it becomes such a great weight that they, they sometimes struggle to carry it there's the gray go away bird that's making all the noise There you go, the grey go away birds we heard. Perfect. Good morning, Diana from Texas. Las Vegas, sorry. Diana from Las Vegas. Um, Diana would like to know which which sex makes the deep rumble um, when you're near them. It's both sexes and, and that's how they communicate with each other. So it's both sexes that make that noise. So let me just move, see if we can see I'm pushing that tree. Wow. So, that gives you an idea how incredibly strong an elephant is. He just took that whole tree out. So the herd has moved off into quite a thick area. Oh, sorry. It's okay, carry on. Beating my cameraman with branches this morning. So, I don't think, he's not in the best position for us to view him anymore. And the rest of the herd have, have moved off. So we're probably going to do the same uh, and make our way back towards quarantine uh, to see what's happening over there. But. Um, Always wonderful to bump into Ellie's. It was quite nice that we were able to listen to the bush. The bush was uh, explaining to us, or we were reading the bush. We, we stopped to look at a bird. We heard that scream of an, an elephant chasing another elephant. And we moved into the area and we found the elephants. So, always nice when, when you can sort of complete the whole story from a distance rather than um, sort of just bumbling around the corner into them. Uh, let me just 
take a few seconds to get out of here without getting a flat tire. on Twitter. Rosie would like to know, do I know, whoa, there's a big hole. Why? Asian Ellie's squeak and African Ellie's don't. Rosie, I'm afraid I've never actually um, spent any time with Asian elephants and I could not honestly tell you. I have absolutely no idea. I don't know if there's any squeaks. Uh, so, yeah. um, Andrew's worked in Sri Lanka. He says he didn't notice any squeaks. I mean, I think there might be those noises that I've heard uh, African elephants make. They do do quite high-pitched little squeals and squeals rather than squeaks and moans. Um, but I, I, I haven't ever heard Asian elephants. Um, I think I've seen them once when I was very young. Uh, so I, I honestly can't help with that, I'm afraid, Rosie. Sorry. Second, guys, it's starting to drizzle a little bit. I just want to put my books away. You got some water spots in your lens. Water spots. Oh, oh no, I managed to pull out that earpiece because I can't hear any at the moment. Guys, we're about to drop into a deep drainage line, so we might lose you for a few seconds. We're not sure. I just hear, heard an alarming. It's always when we hear an alarm call, we just take a few minutes to, or moments to check around. You never know what it might be. And they do. You see something? I just saw the squirrel run across the back. Ah. They do a lot for a huge variety of, of things. Um, from oh, there he is. And he's looking that way. Ever predators might have passed a while ago. So if he was really, really worried, he'd be doing that noise, but he'd also be flicking his tail. <laughs> Funny looking little guy. So he's definitely looking, and you can get a direction of, of where the danger is coming from, where the squirrel is looking. So he's sort of like, one of our news reporters giving us updates constantly while we're out here. So he's like, oh, 
there's something dangerous here. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't speak squirrel. Otherwise, I'd know whether it was a, a snake or mongoose or a leopard he was shouting at. Um, but they, they are wonderful uh, little animals. And they do give us quite a lot of help when it comes to finding predators. So his call will be the same. No, it is. Slightly different. Um, for different for different uh, predators. I've, I've actually worked with a tracker in the Sabi Sands who, who says he can speak squirrel. He can tell the difference whether it's alarming at a bird of prey or whether it's alarming at a leopard or a mongoose or a snake. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible. And and actually our leopard. We go there, bang, leopard. He goes like, snake. And there's a boom flung in the tree. Snake. And there's a boom flung in the tree. Eagle, and then, uh, a bird of prey, and the martial eagle flying ahead. Oh, what are you up to? Off he goes. So, just, just judging from his, his body language there, he wasn't overly stressed, so it's possible that whatever the threat was passed earlier. And he's just making sure. And a lot of your predatory species, well, change their behavior once they've been spotted. So for example, if a leopard's walking quite stealthy and then all of a sudden all the squirrels see him and go da, 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 immediately changes demeanor, pops its tail up, walks like it so it doesn't care if anything sees it, sort of it's the, the, the game is up so to speak. Yeah. Okay, so I'm leaving that Tambian Glove, um slowly mobile south. Um, Central Road, probably now only about uh, 150 meters to the west of the junction. West. Um, could I get a vehicle line up for that position at Jerry's car? Copy, thank you very much. I'll see that my way. If I'd come from Drakensberger onto Central, um, they were on Central, uh, but slowly mobile sort of southeast from there. So we're starting to get a little bit of moisture in the air. It's starting to drizzle slightly. Um, temperature has definitely got colder again. Uh, I think I'm going to have to close my mix now. So just a quick up, a recap on the morning for those who might have just joined us. Uh, first thing this morning, we went, we went and found the quarantine uh, male leopard who's killed in Parla. Literally about two minutes from where from our camp. Literally about two minutes from where from our camp, um, where we stay, and uh, we spent some time with him this morning. He was feeding, and there was a single hyena underneath. Uh, and then last night I heard a lot of lions roaring to the south to the east of us. So we went and checked our southern and eastern boundaries um, to see if we could uh, find any tracks to see if the lions had crossed. Um, and they hadn't, unfortunately. Um, and then, and then uh, we went to Buffalo's Oak Dam. Uh, had quite a nice sighting of a, a heron surfing a hippo. Uh, and then while we're slowly making our way back down towards where the quarantine male leopard is, um, we stopped to look at the bird and we heard this roar. There's an elephant being upset with another elephant. So we immediately went into the area and we found a small breeding herd of elephants. And now we're going back to where we started in the morning to see if there's been any changes. Um, who knows, there might be more hyena underneath the tree than there were when we we were originally there. Um, I see. Okay, I know where it is. Um, so we're going to head back towards where quarantine's got that impala and see what else is happening there.
because you never know what happens. Um, as I said, there could be could be more more hyenas. Um, who knows? Another leopard might have moved into the area and chased them. Sorry everyone, um, with these little bits of water droplets coming and whatnot, we're just trying to clean the lens for you guys. Make sure you can see nicely. A little bit nervous for this afternoon. The moisture in the air. Temperature's definitely definitely gone down since we got up this morning I'd say when we got going it's probably 15 or 16 degrees maybe it's closer to sort of 12 13 now which I know for you you tough or our northern hemisphere of yours so that's nice it's a balmy summer's evening yeah but for us as poor soft African boys that's quite cold Smile and wave, Andrew. Oh, there's a hippo. As well. I think we're gonna leave this hippo be and head on towards that leopard. Sorry guys, it's quite difficult. We just want to make sure that that lens is nice and Good morning, Rome on Twitter. I would like to know what is my bucket list of animals I haven't seen yet. Oh, I'd say there's so many I'd have to just let's just keep it for the African one. Actually, no, African and Indian. Um, but definitely um, mountain and yala and uh, Ethiopian wolf um, and oh, bongo, definitely bongo, and then obviously, yeah. Uh, Tiger, oh, the, the Ethiopian specials like um, Ethiopian wolf and, and and that is it's the most endangered carnivore in Africa. I'm just going to stand by here for a second while I ask this question. Most endangered carnivore in Africa, um, even more endangered than wild dogs. It's the most endangered canid in the world, and it, and it's. Just an incredibly beautiful animal and it hunts up in the alpine moorlands of, of Ethiopia and the Bale Mountains. Uh, and then Mount Ninyala um, and Bongo, if I got to see them, it's sort of closing out my Trafalagus family. I would have seen all the spiral horned antelope in Africa and Lord Derby's Eland is another one. So those are the three sort of to see all of the whole family. Um, and then tigers snow leopards and things like that from in, in India and in the Himalayas which just be spectacular um, and what are they called? Does I think they call them the Indian wild dog um, really have to get to India actually but I, I think there's just so ma many animals and things out there that I'd love to see um, when I do get the opportunity in time but we've just arrived um, where Mr. Quarantine was this morning so we're just going to pop in and see 
What's happening? I can see that the kill. I don't see him yet. Oh, he's lying right near the bottom right. <laughs> That's quite a funny spot for him to lie. The hyenas are still around. They must be, must the hyenas must not be around. There's two hyenas, and he's lying so low to the ground. That's quite unusual behaviour. Oh, we don't want to disturb the hyena. Let's go around the other side of the tree. So I don't know if you guys... There we go, let's just stop. So there's two hyenas now, so another hyena has arrived on the scene while we've been gone. Oh. No ways. Did you see that? There was uh, a squirrel in this hole, right next to the leopard. It would have killed him being a mongoose. He saw his head pop out of the hole. So here we've got... So he's very, very low to the ground. The hyenas could chase him if they wanted to. It looks like that's possibly the most comfortable branch for him to snooze on. So what I can see if we look up at the, the carcass quickly is um, he's almost eaten the, the whole skull, the, head, the top of the head, and there's just the, the neck left there now. But as I said, there's still a lot of food here. It's still definitely going to be here for another day or two at least. So we're quite lucky. One of the reasons I came immediately first thing in the morning is that I knew the likelihood of feeding was going to be quite high. And I knew as it got later in the morning, the likelihood of him sleeping was going to be much higher. Mm -hmm. So it's still nice to come and check. Oh, here we go. Where are you going, Nisi? I know, not going towards, going away from the leopard. So I'm just going to wait for the other vehicles to finish moving and once they leave we'll move into a different spot where we'll try to get a, a clear view of his face which he's busy just putting in the bush at the moment. So you can see, um, 
quarantines, very distinct, very straight sort of row of rosettes that come up from his tail. I say it looks almost like a landing strip. I don't know if you guys can hear, there's quite a lot of talking um, not too far from us. And it sounds like someone using a spade. And what? And, and that's because we're literally right on the doorstep of the lodge. So life must go on even if there's a leopard with an impala kill. So there's maintenance to be done, meetings to be had. And as we, just for those who, who might not have been with us first thing this morning, um, We, we showed, we showed the leopard, and then where um, all your questions and everything are being fed to, the final control is um, just right there. I'm just going to show you now. Can you see? I don't need to reverse. So you can see that white there. That's the big satellite dish thingy that sends the signal all over the world. Um, so it's probably about 50 meters, 60 meters from uh, our, our final control to the leopard. I'm just going to move around the other side where we can see a bit more. And also the lights will be a bit better. So hopefully we can have a better look at him and the kill. Let's go have a quick look at the kill first. And then I'll move so we can see his face nicely. So you can see he's already, the first thing he would have eaten was all that the heart, lung, liver, brain, kidneys, and then he did eat the whole head, brain, eyes, ears. Now he'll be busy digesting that. Um, if you come down onto the leopard there, you can literally see how fat he is at the moment. That is one bulging belly. You know, it's just. He's just so full. I mean, very, very happy. Uh, guys, if you see the blood on him there, I wouldn't worry too much. That's not from him, that's from the kill, so I don't think he's been hurt. He's going to move back so we can have a nice view of his, his face. And. Good, yeah. Sure come back. Yeah, I'm sure I'll look back now. He just heard something. There we go. It's almost perfectly framed by the, the marula tree. He's in the perfect spot. He's got meat in a tree that's relatively safe, or safe from hyenas at least. Um, he's got water right here with uh, Gauri Dam. So there is a, a strong possibility for those of you going to be watching the, 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 the Juma Cam down at the dam, that he might pop up there as he goes for a drink, or he actually might do it right now. Oh, no, he's going to have, I think he's going to sleep on the ground now that the hyenas have moved off.
Good morning, Ellen from the UK. Ellen would like to know what is the likelihood of him making another kill today? Um, it is very unlikely, but he is an opportunist, all predators. Uh, and if he is wandering down towards the dam to have a drink, and uh, he happens to come across, across some animals and he manages to stalk and catch one, he would definitely attempt to. Uh, and leopards don't have any problem eating rotting meat, so he would probably stash that and then move, or probably eat the, night, the good stuff, the liver, lungs, hearts, etc. Um, and then eat there and then move between the two kills even possibly. Good morning, Bularay. Bularay would like to know what is the height of the kill? Um, I would probably say four and a half, five meters up in the tree. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more, maybe, maybe six meters. Servals' ears look similar to leopards, am I correct? See that, even though we do see leopards sleeping in trees and lying in trees quite regularly, it's, um, they actually prefer, it's more comfortable than to sleep on the ground, and quite often he would only have been staying in the tree and whatnot while those hyenas would hear on the ground. I'm quite sure the hyenas haven't moved far. They probably moved off 50, 60 meters to go find somewhere to rest. But if you ever had to feed or they heard the sound of like a, a piece of meat dropping out of the tree, they would be hurtling back in here at high speed. I hear a lot of squirrels alarm calling in front of us and they're definitely not alarm calling at him. I wonder if there's another leopard over there. Very upset squirrels. Guys, are you sleeping here? I'm just going to go forward a little bit. There's just too much activity over there. I need to just have a... I just want to have a check. I mean, it could quite easily be they're all shouting at a, a brown snake eagle or a, a bird of prey that's sitting on top of a tree. But it is worth having a look. I can hear the squirrels that are climbing up here. Very upset. There's no way these squirrels can see where the leopard is. Long for a hyena? No. Okay. 
was more than one squirrel alarming. Quick look. Very, very upset with that. I can't see anything. So we'll just head back towards. Well, well there's the hyena. That's definitely not what the squirrels are lying at, unless it's the most confused squirrel in the histories of confused squirrels. So I told you the hyenas wouldn't be far. They might go for a drink, find a bush to sleep under. Good morning, Susan from the Netherlands. Susan would like to know why there are less flies around this kill than normal. Um, like a lion kill, is it because um, a leopard cleans his fur better or because of the weather? Susan, it's most definitely uh, the weather. This cool weather is uh, not very good for flies. And also, after a little bit of rain, we've had that little cold snap. Um, a lot of the flies will only, um, there's going to be a lot of new flies after this. We get warm again because they will hatch after the after the rain and with a combination of sun. Did he do a sneaky puff at her? No, he's still there. He's a very tired kitty. A very happy kitty, I'm sure. He's got a big, full belly. So how's that for? What a camouflage. A very content leopard. Lots of meat still up in the tree. Nice cool weather. Water just down the road. It's always great for us to have a, a leopard sighting so close to home and we definitely, between Mark and myself, we will definitely keep following so we can follow the whole story um, as, this, as this impala gets smaller and smaller and then disappears. But on, the, on that note guys, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you with me this morning. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, from everyone at Wild Earth, and uh, unfortunately we weren't able to find any lion tracks. They um, doesn't look like they crossed into our traverse area, but that's the way it is. This isn't a zoo after all, and we're very lucky to have a leopard here, and, um, and some nice elephants as well. So it's been a fan fantastic morning. I really enjoyed it, and I really hope that the rest of you, uh, well, all of you, in fact, will join us this afternoon again. Um, for the next uh, next drive, uh, I think as far as I know, it'll be me again this afternoon. So we'll keep it going. Maybe go look on the boundaries again. Maybe the lions with this nice cool weather might move. Uh, and let's just keep up, keep up. I'll keep you up to date with the news of the bush. Um, on that note, have a wonderful morning or evening wherever you might be in the world, and I'll see you this afternoon.